Hi, this is Natalie. Thank you for listening to Crossroads Church, where we are bringing a real God to real people. I believe you'll be inspired by today's message. We're starting a new series today called The Circle Perspective. And this is based on a book that I have been working on. It's my next book. It's not available yet. Uh, it's actually the first time I'll be sharing all the content in a row here. So you guys get to be my, my guinea pigs, all right? Uh, so uh, we'll be sharing this. And I'll tell you, I don't know that I've ever been quite as excited about sharing a series as this one that I'm about to share this month. Because as I've been writing this book, God has been making a lot of stuff in my life clear uh, that I just, I, some of the questions I had, I just, he's been clearing a lot of it. People ask, you know, how long does it take to write a book? And I, I, for this one, I'm saying 43 years. Today's my 43rd birthday. Um, but I've actually been typing on it for about two months. But we're going to be talking about it because here's the thing. I, I know a lot, about, a, a lot about you guys. I know a lot of you right now. Uh, in the last year, this has been about kind of, it's, it's been this very confusing season for many of us. We're going, God, what are you doing? And we expected God to maybe do some things that he didn't do. And a lot of people are having doubts about God. I've seen a lot of guys getting out of ministry right now. And it's just been a very challenging year where we're going, what is happening? What are you doing, God? A lot of us have lost loved ones. Some of us have gone through divorces. We're seeing financial struggles. And we're going, what is happening? Where is God all in all of this? And my goal in this, um, in this series is to maybe help us get a different perspective on how God works in our lives and what he does. Because... Uh, I'm convinced that God works more in circles in our life than in straight lines. In fact, if you read Psalm 23, one of our fav- favorite psalms we all know, the Lord is my shepherd, right? We love that. It's kind of comforting to think God's guiding me. Um, he's got me. The Lord is my shepherd. He guides me in paths of righteousness for the sake of his name. But here's what's fascinating about this verse. In Hebrew, if you read it in Hebrew, this word paths could actually be more accurately translated as the Lord is my shepherd. He guides me in paths made of circles. The Hebrew word is magol. And it's this weird word. It's like these circular paths. And if you go to Israel and you, you, you see there's all these hills where they're big, tall hills and they've got these circular paths around them. You talk to a shepherd and they say, well, our sheep, our big poofy sheep, they don't do well going straight up a hill. So to gently guide them, we've got to kind of take them in circular paths up the hill. And I think that is a perfect example of how God works in our lives. I wish he worked in straight lines, took me straight from point A to point B, but he doesn't do that. He knows what you're ready for. He knows what you can take. And so he starts taking you in circles. And I believe that every season of life is a circle where a certain group of things happen. There's a certain predictable pattern that you can see in every season of life. And that's what we're going to be talking about over the next few weeks, because I want you to get a perspective on what God's doing right now, but also on what he's been doing. Because a lot of times what we need to get us through this hard season is to remember, oh yeah, God got me through a season before. And it's not the same. I mean, you've seen that. A lot of times we say, you know, I wish I could, I just want to go home. And then you go home and it's not what you thought home was going to be. You move back to the place where you came from and it's not what you thought it would be. Because as you've been in this circle, the circle has been widening and you can never get back to the same place you were before because it looks different. You've changed, the place has changed, and that's a good thing. Because God is ever want, wanting, to every, wanting you to ever expand into who he has for you to be. So that's the concept we'll be sharing. But I wanted to start this morning by telling you about one of the most confusing, frustrating, fear-filled seasons or circles of my life. It started about a year after Emily and I were married. I was about to start leading these outdoor adventures that you guys, you know, have been hanging around here long. And, you know, I lead these outdoor adventures around the world. I had just gotten my first author, a famous author, nationwide known. He was going to come and hike with me. And I was like, man, the Lord is making my dream come true. We are about to start doing outdoor adventures around the world. And right in the middle of that, I got a call from my friend David. And David is a missionary in Mexico, very rough part of Acapulco. He lived right in the center of the ghetto, the drug trafficking trade center. He was a missionary there and he called me and he said, hey, Joel, um, we feel like God is calling you and Emily to move down here and take over our ministry in Acapulco. And I said, no, no, no. That's not my call, David. That's not, you know, that's not my call. He's like, I know. He said, you're the least likely candidate. (laughs) But we feel like we're supposed to call you. And listen, he was right. I was the least likely candidate. So David, he lived in this neighborhood that was crazy. The the grandma next to him was like one of the biggest drug dealers in the area. (laughs) Next to her was a guy who had killed two girls. 
and left their bodies in the basketball court, but somehow he knew somebody and so he had gotten off scot-free. Across the street from him was the head of the gang who had shot somebody point blank eight times, like right in, right in the face, fled to the U.S., got arrested in the U.S., got thrown in prison, then deported and then came back and somehow had paid off the cops and he was just running free in the streets. In fact, David had actually gotten into a fist fight with that guy in front of the whole neighborhood, beat him up, took him to the ground and had him in a chokehold. And the, the, the whole neighborhood was like, afterwards they were like, we thought David was gonna kill him. David had him in a chokehold in the name of Jesus and <laughs> had him on the ground and he walked up, walked away, picked him up, gave him a hug. And David had serious street cred after that. Everybody's like, man, we thought David was gonna kill him. He was like the baddest missionary ever. Uh, <laughs> David's like six foot six, massive dude. And I'm just a skinny little white guy, right? And so I'm not the right guy for this job. David says, I know you're not the right guy for this job, but we think you're the one that's supposed to do it. And I'm like, no, David, I'm not. And we keep going back and forth. And finally, I'm, I'm done with this conversation. So I pulled out the trump card that you use in Christian conversations when you're done. You say, hey, brother, let me pray about that. That's what you use if you, somebody's asking you to do something you don't like. You say, let me pray about that. And he's like, Okay, okay, pray about it, right? So we hang up the phone, I move on, I'm gonna plan my outdoor adventures. Well, two weeks later, he calls me and he's like, hey bro, what'd you hear? And I was like, about what? He's like, you didn't even pray about it. I'm like, David, that is breaking the rules. When somebody says I'm gonna pray about it, you don't follow up. It means leave them alone. He's like, no, but what, it, seriously, bro, this is seriously, what did Emily think? And the truth was, I hadn't told Emily because I knew she would actually pray about it. <laughs> I said, well, David, she's, she's in Guatemala studying Spanish because she felt like the Lord told her to go improve her Spanish for some reason. So he's like, well, well, ask her what she thinks. And I'm like, oh my gosh, I do not want to ask Emily what she thinks. So we hang up the phone. I call Emily. She's in Guatemala. She's like, I think we should pray about it. She calls me back two hours later and she's like, all right, let's go down there and check it out. I'm like, oh. So we go check it out. We end up feeling like we're supposed to go that direction. I'm not super excited about it, but I feel like that's what the Lord's telling us to do. So here's what happens. We realized we've got to raise support. And typically to raise financial support to go on the mission field, it takes about a year. So I'm thinking, there's how we're going to get out of this. If people don't give, somebody will come in and fill, up, fill in in the meantime, and we won't have to go. So I sent out one little letter. I was like, maybe we think, maybe possibly we're going to go to Mexico, blah, blah, blah. In one letter, we were fully funded with the monthly support we needed to go on the mission field. Amen. No, not amen. <laughs> I was so mad. It's like, God, you provide for this, but not the stuff I really want. Where's my Maserati? No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> Top of it, we needed a truck to go down to Mexico. We needed a good solid truck. We had two trucks donated to us. I'm like, oh my God. We moved down to Mexico and it was horrible. We had our house broken into within a sh sh few short weeks of getting there. They stole all the stuff from our church. I found out who did it, went down the street and confronted the guy. And afterwards people were like, I'm surprised you're still alive. Not the guy to confront. I didn't know. The cops constantly harassed, uh, harassed us. Corrupt cops were always pulling me off. I got to the point, I was so fed up with corrupt cops. The one morning we were driving out on a Sunday morning and I saw a cop and I could tell, he, I saw him. He looked at me, he started turning on his lights, flashing his lights to pull me over. And I'm like, I have done nothing wrong. That guy is trying to hit me for, up for a bribe. I was so mad. I kind of did a quick evaluation. I'm like, he's in a four cylinder VW. I've got a six cylinder Nissan. I can outrun him. <laughs> and I did. Got into a high speed chase. But I evaded the cops. <laughs> All for Jesus' name. <laughs> the whole, okay, so here's what happens. It's like goes from bad to worse down there. The whole experience was horrible. I was angry and fearful the whole time. In fact, at one point I ticked off the head of the gang and our, one of our church members came over and he's like, hey, pastor, I think you need to take my gun because the gang's gonna try something. I'm like, I was like, hold up, guns are very illegal in Mexico. Where'd you get this gun? He's like, oh, pastor, don't ask, don't ask. I didn't take the gun, but he's like, they're going to do something bad to you. And we, we were holed up for several days in fear of this gang and that they were threatening us. Whole time, I was just terrified, so much fear, so much anger. Long story short, nine months later, we end up, the organization in the U.S. says, we need to close down the ministry. We close the ministry. And I remember driving out of Mexico thinking, what in the world? That was the worst experience of my life. 
I was fearful. I was angry the whole time. Nobody came to Christ. I think maybe people denied Christ watching me. I don't know. (laughs) It was a horrible experience. I was a horrible missionary. I felt like a total failure. In fact, I heard a story about a guy who walked out of his front porch one one day and he looked down and he saw this little snail and he's like, ah, he picked it up and looked at it and threw it across the yard and went on with his day. But a year later, he hears his knock at his door and he opens the door. And he's like, what? And he looks down and he sees the snail and the snail goes, what was that all about? <laughs> I was that snail. Now, here's what I know about you. I'm guessing you've got some seasons of your life where you're asking, huh, what was that all about? You got some people that you go, man, I just wish I never would have met them. They ruined my life. Like, oh, if I'd have just avoided that call or that text message, or if I would have been in a different place at a different time. You got some seasons of life where you stepped out and you followed God and you were all courageous and then it, you fell flat on your face and you go, what, what was that all about? Or weird seasons of time that you're just like, why did it have to go down that way? And, and a lot of those seasons are super painful. And you look back at that season and maybe like when you're telling your story, you just kind of skip over that. And you're like, yeah, and then I was in Seguin and then I was back in Seguin. And you're like... <laughs> What happened between there? Uh, uh, Too painful to talk about it. We've all got seasons like that. We've got seasons of pain. Maybe we lost somebody, maybe a divorce. And you you just look back and then you go, that was the worst possible time of my life. Well, here's my point this morning. Pain is inevitable. But here's the thing. Your pain can either point you to your destiny or it can point to despair. You have a choice. It all depends on your perspective because we're not getting around pain. In fact, that's what all the great philosophies and the religions of the world are an attempt to explain your pain. If you look at a lot of the the philosophies that have popped up recently, all these critical theories, they're an attempt to explain pain. And they say, you know why you're in pain? Because this person has been oppressing you over here. And we, we get this ideological, they try and sell you on this ideology that if, if you just blame everything on that person, your life will be better because um, it's their fault that you're in pain, right? It's all men's fault. You're like, well, yeah, men have done some bad things, but we live in a broken world. It's more than just man's fault. Well, it's all people of that color. If our country didn't have those kind of people in their con- our, this country, if those that color people, we would be a much better country. You say, hold up, hold up, hold up. That's ideological possession. You're wrong. It's not that simple. We live in a crazy broken world. And the question is, instead of asking why, the question is like, what are you going to do with the pain? In fact, this is one of the key points here this morning. It's not wise to ask why in the middle of pain. It's good. Yeah. The better question to ask is, what am I going to do about it? Because you may never get an answer in the middle of pain. And here's the really bad problem in pain. When you're in pain, you can't get a clear answer on anything. And you may come up with some really messed up explanations for why. And your, may, your perspective may get totally tainted. And it could mess with you forever. And here's what happens. If you've got a wrong perspective on your pain, it's going to lead you straight to despair. And despair, you know what eventually it says to you? It says this. There's no point in even trying. You know what you need to do? You just need to watch the world burn. I'm never, you're never going to get out of your pain because those oppressive people, those people that are doing bad things to you, that person that did horrible things to you and got away with it, there's no justice. So what you want to do is you just want, we all to get to a point where we just want to watch the world burn. And we've all been to a place like that where you're just like, that person didn't hurt me, but they're like that person that hurt me. I would love to see pain come upon them. And you get really, we just get angry. But here's the thing, it never makes you feel better because it's this vortex. You're like, ah, those people got it, but it's still not the person that did wrong to me. And so we start blaming people. And and the thing is, it keeps you in victimhood and victimhood goes nowhere good. Hey, that rhymed. Victimhood goes nowhere good. (laughs) It just leaves you blaming people. And here's the thing, it leads eventually to despair and you're just depressed and discouraged. And you're like, ah, if I could just get all those people out of my life that are like this and it doesn't work. But there's another option. And this is the hope that we believe as Christians. Your pain can actually point to your destiny. That's the redemptive thing. Redemption means taking something bad and turning it around for good. And our God is an expert in that. And he's saying this, listen, your pain, that thing that you keep bumping up to against, you're like, why can't I get past this? Oh, your pain is pointing to your destiny. In fact, I believe that your pain is pointing to the very thing you're called to bring into this world. 
The thing you keep jumping up against, why isn't this this way? What if this, if, if, this, if only this hadn't happened? Well, listen, it happened. Stop asking why, because here's the problem. with Life is lived forward, but it can only be understood looking backwards. Life can only be understood backward, but you have to live it forward. And a lot of people, they get stuck in the pain, trying to figure, I need an answer. I need answers. And there are no answers. And so you just become, you fall into despair and depression and you get angry. And God's saying, listen, your only option right now is to step out in faith and move forward in spite of the pain. But what happens? A lot of people get trapped in the pain and they never move forward. They can never get past that thing that happened to them or the thing that they think has to be there for them to move forward. If only this, and that never happens and they get stuck there and then they get bitter and resentful and angry. You've met people like that. Maybe you've been there. I've been there sometimes. I find myself getting resentful and I'm like, oh, those people, the reason they're able to do that is because they had a really good upbringing and they had a better life than me and they had access to more money than me. And I become resentful. In the meantime, it's not helping me. It's setting me back. So you've got to decide, am I going to move forward or am I going to get stuck here? And, And here's the thing. The answers will only come as you move forward. And that's the essence of what faith is about. God says, you know, faith isn't a function of, you don't need faith when it's sunshine and unicorns floating across of patches of, you know, little puffy clouds. You don't need faith then. You only need, you need faith like when it gets really dark and you can't see ahead and you're like, God, you want me to go that way? And he's like, yeah, yeah, just take a step. And you're like, I can't see what's ahead. He's like, precisely, just take this next step. And you take the step and a little step at a time. And here's the thing, eventually answers might come but you're not going to get the answers in the middle of your pain. So it's not wise to ask why when you're in the middle of the pain. You've got to choose to move forward. Amen. And that's where we come to this idea of the circle perspective. We know as Christians, our hope, this right here, that the, the, the transition from, pain, from despair to destiny only happens if there's hope here. If there's no hope, despair is your only option. But we have hope. In fact, we know this promise in Romans. It says this, here's our hope. We know as Christians, as followers of Christ, that all things God works for the good of those who love him. Now I hear a lot of people say, well, all things work together for good. And I'm like, nope, you got to read the last part of that verse. All things don't work together for good if you don't have the hope of Christ. All you've got is despair if you don't have that. All things work together of good of those who love him who have been called according to his purpose. Now, this is where, don't, don't, don't get lost in this next section. You're like, what, are these ta- what does this have to do with that? He says this, for those God foreknew, he also predestined to be conformed to the image of his son, that he might be the firstborn among many brothers and sisters. W- what does that mean? Here's what that means. You aren't an accident. Right. You're here on this planet at this space in time with the gifts and talents you've been given with the life that you've had whether you like it or not you're here in this specific time and God planned for you to be here your parents may have told you you were an accident but you weren't (laughs) God had a plan for your life before the foundations of the world and here's the cool part about it it says and those whom he predestined he said man I got I got I, I'm, putting, I'm putting them on earth for the, such a time as this. He also called. And he says, here, not only have I put you on earth just to take up space, you're not here to just take up space. I've actually got a specific purpose for you. We're his workmanship created in Christ Jesus for good works, which the Father himself prepared beforehand that we should walk in them. And it says, but he didn't just call you. He also justified you. He saved you from yourself and your sins. Because man, most of the time we get in our own way, Right? It says he justified you. And those he justified, he also glorified. And here's where I love, there's this verse. It says this light and momentary affliction that we're going through is preparing in us an eternal weight of glory. That circle that you're walking around, it's like I'm walking around in circles. Yeah, but that circle keeps getting wider and wider. And it's like glory on every time you come back around. That's the circle that he's taking you on and he's taking you somewhere good, but you've got to trust that he called you. Well, what, so what's the call? You're like, well, what is the call? Here, here's the call. The call is simply this. Seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness and all these things 
will be added to you as well. And you say, well, what things? Well, the context of this verse is something that you guys are very familiar with if you've been listening to me for the last four years. I wrote a whole book about it. I'm not gonna go in depth on it. I know there's a lot of new people here. It's in the back if you want it, but this is what the essence of it is, okay? The things that we want, the things that we we seek first, but he says, you gotta seek, all these things will be added to you if you seek me first, is this. The things that we're all seeking, every hope and dream, every fear you have comes down to these three things. We all want security, feeling safe, We want to know that we've got financial security, emotional security, relational security, physical security. We all want to feel connected with others. We want to feel valued and loved, that people care about us and esteem us. And we all want to feel a sense of control, empowerment, the ability to make our own decisions. And here's the crazy thing. This is what Jesus says. He's like, I know you want all this stuff. You're worried about what you're going to wear, where you're going to live, who's going to take care of your, your retirement. But here's what I'm telling you. If you want that stuff, Don't seek that stuff. That sounds super Zen of Jesus, right? Like, don't look at the water or the water becomes like, what does that mean? He says, listen, don't seek that stuff. What you got to do is you got to seek the kingdom of God and his righteousness and all that other stuff will materialize because you've got stuff in the right order. Now that is the, the walk of faith. Do we really believe that God is going to bring our security connection and control when we stop seeking our security connection and control and instead seek whatever he asks us to do and step out into the unknown? And they say, yeah, but if I step away from what I know, I might not have security connection or control. And God says, precisely. That's the faith part of it. And here's the thing. If this is all you're seeking your whole life, your world will be very, very small because fear shrinks your world. We've seen that this year. COVID was a threat to all three of these things. Fear eventually leads to anger. You wonder why there's so much anger in the streets? I saw it coming back in March. I'm like, man, there's a lot of fear. We're going to have to have an outburst of anger somewhere. And sure enough, in June, something terrible happens to George Floyd. Explosive anger all over the country because fear always leads to anger. Here's the thing. Fear shrinks your world. When you're constantly worried about your own security connection or control, you don't have the courage to step out. But here's the thing. The only way you beat what you fear is by facing the thing you fear in small doses. Fear can't be ignored and it'll go, it doesn't go away just by ignoring it. You literally have to step out and face the thing you fear in small doses and that's how you conquer it. And so Jesus says this. He says, look, I know you want all this, but you've got to step out and transcend your desire for security and connection and control if you want to find meaning. Because there's no meaning seeking your own security, connection, and control. The only meaning you're going to find is when you step out of seeking that, then you can maybe look back and go, oh, that's what that was all about. But in the middle of your pain, when you feel the threat to your security, connection, and control, you say, well, this is the worst time to do that. It's actually probably the best time. Because the cave you fear to enter holds the treasure that you seek. But you've got to be willing to step into the dark. And then you might find meaning. There's a story, Genesis, great story, story of Joseph. This is not Joseph, Jesus' dad. This is Joseph from the Joseph and the Technicolor Dreamcoats. Maybe you can think, think of it that way. Joseph has a dream early on. He has a dream that he's going to do great things. That is, actually, his family's going to bow down to him. And he tells his family about it. Be careful who you tell good news to, okay? And his family gets mad. They're like, who do you think you are? You're a little punk kid telling us we're going to bow down to you? And he's like, I'm, I'm just sharing what I, the, the call, the vision that I got. And they're like, who do you think you are? Anyways, his family's mad at him. One day, Joseph's out going to check on his brothers. They throw him in a pit. They sell him into slavery. His own brothers sold him. They trafficked, they crossed border trafficking. They sold their brother into slavery. But Joseph somehow manages to keep a good attitude as a slave. Well, then he gets lied about. No good deed goes unpunished. He gets lied about. His his master's wife says, oh, he tried to seduce me. And Joseph actually did the opposite. He ran from her who was trying to seduce him. He gets thrown in prison. He was doing the right thing and he gets thrown in prison. Then in prison, he gets forgotten about. Well, anyways, over and overnight, he gets removed. It's like the ultimate rag to riches story from the pit into being the second most powerful man in all of Egypt. And somehow the dude managed to keep his perspective in all of it. I don't know how. He didn't let his pain lead to despair. He kept focused in his pain. He's like, somewhere this is leading me to my destiny. And here's what happens. A drought, a famine happens, and his brothers come looking for help. 
They don't even recognize him because his circle, he's been growing into glory. They don't even recognize who he is. He's standing up there and he's like, that's my family. Oh my goodness. OMG. <laughs> the dream just came to pass. They don't recognize him. And then he reveals who he is to them and they freak out. They're like, we're dead. <laughs> we're dead. And here's what Joseph said. And he said, hey, hold up guys. But Joseph said to them, no, 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 don't be afraid. Don't be afraid. Somehow Joseph had worked through the perspective on this. I don't know how. I'd be angry and resentful. I'd be like, oh, now you're going to get it. <laughs> but no, Joseph said, nope. Am I in the place of God? You intended to harm me. Ah, but God intended it for good to accomplish what is now being done, the saving of many lives. And listen to me. This is your story too if you don't let the pain turn to despair, if you keep hope that the thing that God put in your heart is he's going to bring it to pass, but you've got to keep the right perspective and realize he's working. He's taking you up that hill, layer at a time, circle at a time. He's working you, taking you to a place. And we'd like to go straight line, but we can't handle a straight line. He has, he, the gentle shepherd knows how to guide you where he needs you to get. And here's the ultimate goal. The ultimate goal is going to be the saving of many lives. So over the next few weeks, we're going to be looking at the pattern of this circle that God leads us on. In each season of life, there's a couple key components. Uh, so keep your perspective lifted. The key components are this. You're living your life looking for security, connection, or control. This is the chart we'll use for the whole series. I'll give you a little workbook next week if you want to go through it. It's a short workbook to help you kind of process your life. And in each season, God calls you out to step out beyond your fear. And usually it happens with a crisis. Something happens. You, a loss of a loved one, a divorce, an illness, finding out someone's sick. And it comes as a crisis. But then God says, I need you to trust me in this. I'm taking you somewhere. And immediately you take the call and you start to step into an adventure. Think about Luke Skywalker. He's minding his own business. We love the, all the story. Every story you love follows this same format. <laughs> Luke Skywalker's minding his own business. All of a sudden, a little droid shows up. It says, this little hologram shows up. Help me, Obi-Wan Kenobi. You're my only hope. <laughs> the next day, Luke gets invited into an intergalactic battle to save the universe from the forces of darkness. And Luke's like, who am I to do this? And he's like, oh, you've got something good in you, buddy. You don't even realize it's in there. And a lot of you today, we're going to talk about this next week in the call. A lot of you right now are saying, I know there's more in me than what I'm doing right now. So we're going to talk about what to do with that call. Because you've got a call in you, right? And so every hero has that. Frodo, he's minding his own business in the Shire. And Gandalf shows up and says, I need you to take this ring. You're the only one that can do it. So he takes the ring, right? And then they immediately face a series of challenges. And these challenges make the character stronger. That's where it says, we rejoice in our suffering for we know that suffering produces endurance. Endurance produces character and character produces hope. And hope is what we need to make sure that our pain doesn't turn to despair. Instead, it turns to our destiny suffering and challenges. We'll talk about that in week three. And then the fourth week, we're going to talk about the message. Let me pray for you. <laughs> Father, we thank you so much that you are working in us to will and to act according to your good pleasure. We thank you that the path of the righteous is like the light of dawn that shines brighter and brighter and brighter. We thank you that no weapon that is formed against us will prosper. All those who rise up against us will fall. We thank you that you will be glorified in our life. And I just pray for people that are struggling this morning, man, they're going, why? Why, why? Lord, I just prayed you would fill them with a deep sense of hope and help them to not fall into despair, but to recognize there's, where this is going somewhere if I hold on to hope. And the hope is Jesus. If you're here this morning and you do not have your life surrendered to Jesus, that's the first step. There is reason to despair if you don't have your life given to Jesus. So if you're here this morning, you know you need to get that relationship right. I'm going to say a prayer in just a second. If you say that prayer and you mean it with all your heart, God's going to come and take you from the kingdom of darkness, forgive your sin, transfer you to the kingdom of light, and get you an eternal address set up in the kingdom of God. So let's say this prayer together. Lord Jesus, we repent. If you are ever in the Seguin area, come visit us on Sunday mornings at 9 or 11 a.m. Or you can just download our app and receive our weekly messages right to your phone. Just text CC Seguin to 77977 and click on the link that you receive. May the remainder of your week be enriched with God's favor and blessings.